Hello and welcome to this video on congenital heart diseases. First, we're going to look at an overview of cyanotic versus acyanotic congenital heart diseases. Then we're going to talk in detail about what happens in an atrial septal defect and then what happens in a ventricular septal defect. What are some of the symptoms of the acyanotic heart disease and a little cartoon to help you remember the differences between the two. So let's get started. Congenital heart diseases are heart diseases that are developed intrauterine, leading to congenital abnormalities that are often diagnosed um, and symptomatic after birth. What are the differences between cyanotic versus acyanotic heart disease? Well, the differences between cyanotic and acyanotic heart disease lie in the shunting. Is the shunting right to left or is the shunting left to right? This is really important to understand. So if you remember that the, um, that the body, that the blood that is returning from the body into the right atrium from the superior and inferior vena cava is blue because essentially it's deoxygenated blood. It has a lot less lower volume quantity of oxygen. Therefore, you get, you're getting this blue blood from this human body back into the right atrium. From the right atrium, that blue blood enters into the right ventricle where it goes into the pulmonary arteries and it enters the lungs. From the lungs, this deoxygenated blue blood picks up red blood picks up oxygen the red blood cells pick up oxygen and that as that oxygen is collected in the lungs then this oxygenated blood leaves the lungs and comes and enters the left atrium of the heart once it enters the left atrium of the heart from there it can go into the left ventricle and then supply from the aorta the body now, as you can imagine, if there is a defect, if there is some sort of uh, problem or abnormality within this wall which separates the right ventricle from the left ventricle, that may be known as a ventricular septal defect, that's going to cause mixing of this blue and red blood. In fact, if from the right side, we know that the blue blood was entering the heart on the right side and as it left the right side, it was going back into the pulmonary um, to enter the lungs. But if remember, there is some sort of fault which causes this right-sided blue blood to mix with the left-sided blood, aka a right-to-left shunt. A right-to-left shunt would then cause cyanosis. We measure the oxygen in the arteries. So the oxygen in the arterial oxygen capacity might be 90% or more than 90% is the oxygen quantity in the arteries. But in the veins, it might be less than 90%. But when we have an oxygen quantity in the arteries less than 90%, if it's 80 to 90%, that is quite low. That is going to result in cyanosis. Now, what exactly is cyanosis? Cyanosis is a low partial pressure of oxygen leading to a bluish discoloration of the skin and the mucosa. Remember, if the cyanosis is found in the tongue and in the oral mucosa, that is typically a central cyanosis, even if it's also present in the fingers. But if it's missing in the central mucosa, in the oral mucosa, it's known as peripheral. So what is cyanotic heart disease? Cyanosis is blue mucous membranes and nail beds and skin secondary to an absolute concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin of 3 grams per deciliter. This is typically present in a right to left shunt. This means that the blood, if you have a right to left shunt, instead of the blood taking the longer route all the way to the lungs, the blood is shunting from the right ventricle into the left ventricle, for example. This right to left shunt means that the blood completely bypasses the lungs. And it, as it bypasses the lungs, it will result in a higher level of blue blood entering the systemic circulation. And, and what it actually is, is imagine if instead of going through this route and going all the way around like this, the blood just goes straight from the right to the left, right to the left, and it doesn't have a chance to pick up any of that oxygen. A cyanotic heart disease. So this is the one that is a left to right shunt. Well, we already have red blood in the left side of our heart. Now, if it goes from a left to a right shunt, I don't mind that because that means that the blood is still oxygenated. It is after the point of which the pulmonic circulation has already oxygenated it. There would be no mixing of the blue blood, no cyanosis. So how can I remember that 
uh, right to left shunt means cyanosis. Just think of a blue Rolls Royce. Here's a blue Rolls Royce. When it's blue, roll Royce. So it's a right to left shunt, which leads to cyanosis. And these cyanotic heart diseases typically start with T's. So it could be truncus arteriosus, transposition of the great vessels, tricuspid atresia, or tetralogy, um, sorry, a tetralogy of Fallot. And the acyanotic heart diseases, the L to the R's, are the abbreviations like ASD, VSD, PDA, and coarctation of the aorta. So what happens in a ventricular septal defect? A ventricular septal defect is an abnormal opening in the ventricular septum which connects the left and right ventricle. The ventricular septum is a septum which is lining the ventricular wall uh, between the left and right ventricles. It allows, if there's a defect here, that means that there's a hole. And these holes typically spontaneously close within six months after birth. But ventricular septal defect is uh, contributes to a large majority of causes of congestive heart diseases in the neonate or in the infant. So the ventricular septal defect can be of two types. What are those two types? Well, the VSD may be membranous or, or it may be muscular because the ventricular septum has a membranous part and a muscular part. There could be three sizes. It could be less than 0.5 centimeters, which is considered a small VSD. Or it could be medium size, which is 0.5 to 1 centimeter. Or it could be large VSD, which would be more than 1 centimeter, which would definitely require surgical treatment. Now, what kind of treatment you go for? The small VSD typically does spontaneously close by itself or spontaneously resolve. But the large VSD, it does take um, surgery. A VSD, because it is a left to right shunt, why is it a left to right shunt? Well, essentially, what is happening is that you have a higher blood pressure. So the systemic blood pressure in the left side of the heart is 120 over 80, but the pulmonary blood pressure is 25 over 8. That's just the blood pressure in the pulmonary vessels and systole is 25 versus 8 in diastole. So what we're talking about is a much higher pressure. Remember the left ventricle is more thick. It's thicker, it's more muscular. It allows for a contraction against a whole systemic resistance. Remember the left ventricle is pumping blood into the aorta. And to pump that blood into the aorta, it must have a high enough pressure to to overcome the resistive forces of the systemic vasculature. The systemic vascular resistance must be overcome by a high enough blood pressure of the left ventricle each time as it contracts. Contraction one, contraction two. So now we realize that the left ventricular pressure is very, very high. So if there was a hole between the left and the right ch rooms, chambers of the heart, if there was a hole, let's say if water was rushing through a pipe, through there were two pipes rushing through water, and the water was rushing at a much higher force in the left pipe. As soon as there's a hole between the left and right pipe, that's going to result in the pressure, the high amount of water that was pumping with such brute force, such high force in the left pipe to quickly flow into the right. That's just because high of the physics of high to low pressure gradient it will always flow from high to low that's why if there is a shunt if there is a hole between the ventricles there will be a left to right shunt and that would have been acyanotic because it's already pi bypassed the palm pulmonary circ sorry i shouldn't use the word bypass it's already gone through the pulmonary circulation now you're just getting red blood which is going into the left side of the heart into the blue side but you're spreading oxygenated blood that's why it would be considered acyanotic now the important thing you need to remember is that um a cyanotic heart disease like ASD and VSD, like the one I just told you about, pulmonary stenosis and PDA, the most common symptom in a baby of a cyanotic heart disease is congestive heart failure. Now, how does that evolve? 
The way that the congestive heart failure evolves, if you follow with me, is that over time you're pumping more and more blood from the left chamber of the heart to the right chamber of the heart. As you do so, the right ventricle is going to get volume and pressure overload. Now you're getting more and more volume of blood into the right ventricle, which is not it's not coped it's not able to cope with. Over time, the pressure and volume overload is going to lead to this right ventricle to hypertrophy. As that right ventricular hypertrophies, it's going to cause congestive heart failure. It's going to cause congestion in the right side of the heart. Um, it's going to cause congestion in the right side of the heart. And remember, now you have a more end diastolic volume as well. You have a more you have more volume going into the lungs and more volume of blood returning to the left ventricle. So over time, this right ventricular hypertrophy is going to lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. And that's going to cause congestive heart failure. The symptoms of congestive heart failure, remember acyanotic heart disease always presents with congestive heart failure, congestive heart disease, sorry. So that presents with shock, tachypnea, which is a fast breathing rate, and cyanosis. Note that cyanosis and hypoxemia, well, it's actually known as acyanotic, so I don't know why it says cyanotic, cyanosis there, because over time, over time, that congestion is going to lead to it. But what does this um, really cause? So congestive heart disease presents with shock, tachypnea and cyanosis. In infants, congestive heart disease presents with difficulty feeding. And you know, babies, they exert a lot of calories as they feed. Feeding is one of the most high metabolically demanding activities for these babies. Therefore, they're going to start to get a faster breathing rate, rapid respiration, easy fatigue, especially upon feeding. So they have feeding difficulty in infants, especially on feeding. On older children, you have signs of congestive heart disease, which is dyspnea on exertion, sh sh shortness of breath and failure to thrive. You're also looking for upper extremity hypertension, so higher blood pressure in the upper extremities as compared to the lower extremities. You're also looking for decreased femoral pulses, facial edema and hepatomegaly, and also you're looking for murmurs. As you can imagine, because of this shunting, as the blood shunts from the left to the right side, when do you think that shunting will be the most prominent and the strongest? In systole. Contraction? Contraction. So each time there's a contraction, that um, shunting will be loud. It will be loud. And the ventricular septal defect murmur, in fact, it will radiate to the left lower sternal border because that's where the ventricular septum is found. So it's throughout the whole of systole. Just imagine this murmur. It's happening throughout all of systole. Ventricular septal defect. Keep this picture in mind. Memorize this picture. Remember it. It's a holocystolic murmur. As you can imagine, the shunt is throughout all of systole. So it's going to be holocystolic. It's going to also be in the lower left sternal border. And it's going to have a loud pulmonic S2. Almost half of all cases spontaneously close within the six months. When, do we, uh, when are we indicated a VSD for surgical repair? If there's failure to thrive, pulmonary hypertension or a right to left shunt. What does that mean? This is how a VSD evolves. Remember I told you about that right ventricular hypertrophy and how that volume overload would eventually cause left ventricular hypertrophy? Well, as a compensatory mechanism, you can imagine here are the pulmonary arteries. As there's more and more blood being pumped into the pulmonary arteries as well, you can just imagine the, pro the proximal part will be dilated, but to compensate for this high volume and high pressure, the distal part of these pulmonary arteries will start to constrict. The reason it's constricting is it's because it's trying to compensate for this higher volume being pumped into it. And it decides, basically the heart decides, if I start to narrow my tunnels, if I make it harder for the blood to pump, maybe I will not get so much blood being pumped into me. So the pulmonary vascular just stiffens, hardens and narrows. This leads to a higher pulmonary resistance. The pulmonary resistance rises and rises, and as the pulmonary resistance rises, it leads to pulmonary hypertension. Now we can imagine that 
that the right heart pressure has built up so much so that at this point the right heart pressure is so high that the pulmonary resistance is higher, the pressure is higher. Eventually the palm right side pressure is going to be so high that there's a reversal of shunt. So I always remember Eisenmenger syndrome as a roar, reversal of shunt. Now it's going from right to left. What is Eisenmenger syndrome? The pulmonary resistance is so high that it's higher than the systemic resistance, which leads to a reversal of shunting, which then can cause cyanosis. It causes mixed blood. Now you have that right to left blood, that blue blood going to the red blood. That's caused, causing called a reversal of shunting. Eisenmenger syndrome is pulmonary hypertension with a reversed shunt. A large left to right shunt may cause in irreversible high pulmonary vascular pressure, high pulmonary vascular resistance. When the pulmonary vascular resistance gets too high, it's going to cause a reversal of the shunt going to right to left. Causes a bidirectional shunt flow with resultant hypoxemia. Now you have low blood pressure within your arterial blood too, leading to hypoxemia, which is low of partial pressure oxygen in the blood. Eisenmenger syndrome is not actually something that you are born with. It is a pathophysiological condition which comes as a result of this right ventricular pressure, right ventricular pulmonary hypertension. That's everything for a VSD and symptoms of congestive heart disease. I'll talk about ASD in the next video.